Welcome back. Be excellent to each other and party on, dudes. I am here, ready to share with you the trophy that I won a few minutes ago, and we're going to recap some games. So, um, first of all, I'll show you the deck I'm playing. Uh, this is Esper Stoneblade. It's got Thought Seizes, it's got Bowmasters, and it's got the traditional you know removal suite that you get with white. And it's got a couple planeswalkers too that are very powerful. And importantly, it has Merc Tides, which I found can totally steal games. Cryptic Coat, an incredible equipment. You can always fetch it if you need a blue card to go with your force. And it provides inevitability and an engine in grindier matchups. For sideboard, uh, I've got technically when I played earlier, I had one Nile Spell Bomb, two Surgicals. Um, but I've switch those to two spell bombs because as you'll see spell bomb just completely overperforms in these we're actually going to review seven matches because mtgo servers went down and essentially i got to like restart the league uh so i'll show you those um those other matches but here uh the other changes i added the merc tide in place of a second narset so i had two narsets but I, I really do think two Narsets is overkill with decks being as aggressive as they are. Now, I'd much rather have a, set, a third Murktide, but in this actual league, I, ha I just had two Murktides. So again, this is what I would play if I was queuing back in, but it's not exactly what I played earlier. All right, let's go to the replays. So I'm going to show you the one I lost before the server crashed uh, against a seasoned rescan player. Rescam, of course, the deck that I fear the most. It's definitely the best deck in the format right now, in my humble opinion. So I got lucky, won the line, the draw. And I think I looked him up and I knew that he, again, I don't know the gender of the people here, but I'm just going to say he because I'm used to saying that. I don't know whether he had, um, whether he had any, explosive starts but this is not a hand that i would throw back in really any circumstance like if you look at it three fetches so i can completely play on basics if i want uh brainstorm two brainstorms that i can potentially send cards back i mean this is such a strong hand and narset is something that i can potentially pitch to force or it may be useful late in the game so and stoneblade is our path to victory so this is like one of the best possible hands you can get with Stoneblade. So I didn't throw it back, even knowing that I was up against Stoneblade or uh, up against Rescam. So here, I'm just going to start going and I play nice and slow. My opponent plays really slow as well. And their opening doesn't actually give me Rescam vibes, even though they've been playing Rescam on MTGO recently, according to uh MTG Goldfish. I always search my opponent's username to see what they're playing before I go in against them, and I recommend you do the same. So at this point, they play as Golding Tarn, and I really don't know why there's a Scalding Tarn in a scam deck, and I think maybe it's not a scam deck. Yes, there's probably like one or two non black, non blue fetch lands in uh, non polluted deltas. But I'm able to brainstorm even though I don't have any recourse if they happen to have a uh, Bowmaster. So I successfully, luckily, play in without worrying about Bowmaster there. And of course, I find a Bowmaster on my own in case they do have a Bowmaster. And here, I'm not going to return the same courtesy to them. I am going to go ahead and play this out because, again, they could be on like, let's say hypothetically these lands, if I just saw these two lands, I would probably assume they were on like show and tell maybe. Sneaky Cho or um, on like soul, uh, perhaps like Jeskai or something like that. So I think it's very reasonable to go ahead and try to punish their brainstorm. And if they are on rescam, they probably don't have a way to remove this. So yeah, I go ahead and resolve it. I ping them a whole bunch and I've got a pretty decent clock on the table. I've got force back up in case they attempt to do anything too crazy. But yeah, this is definitely scam. Only scam plays troll generally. And sure enough, instead of waiting to main phase it, now they probably would have waited to main phase or uh, to hard cast grief instead of pitch cast if I hadn't put a clock on the table. So in a way, that was very good because it forced them to use this. But unfortunately that means they're stripping my force of will. Uh and I'm I'm not gonna force 
a grief. I'm not going to pretend to be strong. Uh, I'm always going to wait until there's a reanimation spell and force that. And unfortunately they do have the reanimation package in hand and Atraxa is going to resolve. I don't brainstorm here because I suspect they probably have days or some sort of force at this point and brainstorming, you know, blowing my fetch land, which, you know, I'm going to have to, I'm not going to have white if I go fetch because there's a very real risk that they're going to reveal a wasteland off of this Atraxa. So this would basically stick me on a non-basic, which is going to get wasted. And yeah, I just, in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to remove this. That's why I'm playing four source of plowshares, three prismatic endings, brazen borrower. Like I've got so many ways of getting this out of play. So I just let it happen. And unfortunately they do flip grief, reanimate force of will and wasteland <laughs> like four incredibly powerful cards in this matchup. So I don't know what they have in hand, but I know I need to obviously solve this attracts a problem or these no longer matter when they're gaining six life each turn. It doesn't matter. So I brainstorm uh, thought sees is a good pickup. I thought sees, but unfortunately their hand is completely stacked. Let's take a look at this. It's like they had days force. Of will. so they did have the days and I would have been punished had I gone for it. Um, and then they've got double force of will and wasteland and a grief that they can hard cast next turn. So things are going very badly for me at this point. It went from an incredible, like lucky start with being able to brainstorm without getting bow mastered and then being able to bow master their brainstorm to now none of that even mattering because they've got this giant, you know, amazing card on the table. So I take the damage, they start gaining life. Um, at this point, I'm hoping to draw a second force of will, but my hope is stripped. They actually go after the prismatic ending here. Um, and the reason I didn't prismatic ending because I needed to thought seize in order to, uh, remove the animate dead. And so I was trying to find a second blue card to protect my prismatic ending, but yeah. So unfortunately, sometimes you play extremely disciplined and, uh, and you also get lucky and it also doesn't matter. Uh, so I get a coat to go with my force, which I did you know, I'm happy to have that force on the table, but knowing that they have days, I'm not going to Merc Tide and have them force and then, you know, force back just to get a Merc Tide in, on the table. Now, would Merc Tide have even mattered here? It probably wouldn't have, be, considering they have Petty Theft in their hand. They would have just Petty Thefted that, which would have been much more backbreaking than just Petty Thefting the Orc token that doesn't matter. And at this point, they actually do have Lethal on the table. They have six here, and... um they can flash this in and step. So it's not me prematurely getting tilted and conceding. Like I was deterministically dead here. All right. Next game. Again, these are the only two that I lost. The other ones are going to be victorious, but it's important. I think it's more important to review replays from games you lost. Instead of doing a victory lap, let's see how we can tighten up. So was that previous game winnable? I'm not sure. Uh, so many things happen. It's hard for me to know. All right, and this time, of course, I know they're on scam, but I do keep just a solid all-around hand, double Bowmasters, and my thinking here is like, well, you don't have any graveyard removal. A lot of times they board out a lot of their most egregious graveyard cards. Uh, sometimes they'll board out some of their reanimate, or the animate deads, they never board out reanimate, and reanimate should never be boarded out because it's arguably the most powerful card in the format right now, other than maybe like Ancient Tomb. Um, so... Yeah, I uh, I hope that they were going fair. And if they're going fair and they're casting Bowmasters or they're doing other stuff themselves, I can outrun them, right? With uh, So I go ahead and brainstorm to get un in under Bowmasters. And I think I do make a, ma a misplay this game in that you can see that I've got th two more lands in hand and I've got a land on top. And my thinking is if he doesn't waste me here, I'm just going to fetch that away. But lands do become a problem. Like, it seems crazy that lands should become a problem. Let's step back and like talk about rescam. They have three wastelands in their deck. They have four dazes in their deck. Like it is not like you're playing against Delver. Like they don't. It's certainly not like you're playing against uh, Sultai Beans, where they have not only wastelands but they also have the ability to recur those wastelands. Like they have stifles stuff like that. Right? This is not like a tempo matchup. It's just playing a few cards to kind of insulate itself and maybe cheese you with wastelands. But in fact, my deck is so mana hungry that like it does matter. So I do 
believe I fetch away in the land here trying to draw action, especially now that they've got freaking Archon on the table. And, uh, of course, uh, so I fetch this away thinking like, okay, if they have days, they have days. Uh, but I do need to resolve a Teferi here and I probably would be better off. Yeah. And Murktide is definitely a better draw at this point. But if you look at my graveyard, I've got two. So it's only going to be a five, six or a five, five, and they've got a five, six in play. Uh, and this will kill anything when it attacks. This card is just unbelievably powerful against my deck. And, uh, so my only option is to go ahead and bring in a bow masters. And of course, like I can infinitely kind of like stave off the sacrifice effect, but here, this is what I was talking about. Wasteland. If this Murktide were uh, a land, I, I could have pitched one of these bow masters instead and potentially been able to resolve a Teferi. So I do believe I punted here. I believe that if I'd had that land, uh, I don't know what they're, I didn't ask them to show me their hand at the end or anything like that. Often I will do that. If a game's really close, I'll ask, could you please show me your hand? Um, Containment Priest does nothing here. So again, if I had that land, I would have Teferi. I would have the third land. They might have a daze. They might have a force, but I mean, we could potentially bounce this, get this off the table and survive. I'm not saying this is a winnable matchup, but I do think it was a mistake to to put away, to fetch away that uh, planes. All right. Now let's dive into the victory games. So there was one game. So I actually played this game, which we only played one game before the server crashed, but I won it like handily. And let's go over that. This is Enchantress. We're going to see Enchantress again later on in this league. But uh, you can see that like not knowing what they're on, this is an incredibly strong hand. Uh, I can go fetch a basic island here. I opt not to fetch a basic island and to just try to draw into cards. So I uh, line up a ponder. I think I hide some good stuff on top of my deck. I click through it too fast. In fact, I'm, for here, I'm going to switch through. because So I'll just click. Apologies if you can hear that clicking noise. I'm, their UI is terrible. They need to have like hotkeys where you can advance it without having to click a mouse. So at this point... Um, you know, I feel favored. Bowmasters is a beating against Enchantress. Swing in. Uh, I almost never down uptick to fairy, especially knowing that they, they could be playing like Leyline Binding or something like that. I get value here. I essentially kind of like stone rain them a little bit, like bouncing one of their uh, green producing enchantments back to hand. And I'm very happy with that play. So... I pass every turn that pass in here. This is what I was talking about. Ley line binding. Like you almost never want to uptick situation where you uptick. And I, I will show you later in the league when I play against rescam again, I do uptick once. Uh, but in general, I, I just don't think upticking initially is right. You, you almost always want to get the value. So here I like the thoughts. Uh, I think I put back one of the strands and probably a plow. Because plows not like super impactful. I put back both plows. That's how low I am on plows. And I actually sideboard out both on, all four of my plows up against this deck usually because prismatic ending does everything plow does and more. They have a stacked hand, but they don't have any mana. So of course, like I could just try to high roll and hope that they never draw any lands um, and take wild growth and just like stymie their development. But I am pretty sure that I take on uh, I take elephant grass because elephant grass. Uh, basically one of the things on this card is like black creatures can't attack you at all. Right. And that's like most of my threats, including my germ tokens black. So here, I think I just take uh enchantress. I mean, it's the namesake of the deck. So, Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I took, I took elephant grass for the reason I just mentioned. Yeah. All right. So I swing for three. Uh, at this point, I find a Murktide. Murktide closes the game pretty quickly, especially one, two, three, four. This is one of the reasons you play Murktide is because occasionally, you know, this deck, you are absolutely beat down in this matchup. Like you absolutely have to stop them before they can start going off. And here they take away a lot of my pressure, which is fine because I, not only do I have a Brazen Borrower to bounce that, get an additional ping, get an additional mass. And that's what I do. Uh, I actually get my Teferi back and then I bounce on thin ice with Teferi. So I, I cantrip on the way out 
And uh, yeah, they can they can remove both uh, both of these permanents again. But I just drew cards and I cost them valuable tempo. Grew my army, and now I believe I can go ahead and Merktide. There's an argument certainly for just holding Merktide to pair with Force and casting a Stone Forge Mystic, and I may actually do that. I can't remember, but I get my attack in first. They're down to ten or seven. Yeah, so. My clock's really strong, and at this point, I do go for Stoneforge. And, I mean, you just make them have it. I think I get Calder here. I may get uh, Cryptic just so I can cast. No, I get Calder. I think, actually, Cryptic was probably better there just because uh, Cryptic is a threat, and it's something that I can pitch to force if I want to just win with Murktide. Cryptic would be a better threat here because they're so low in life. It's unblockable. I mean... You'll see Cryptic later in this uh, recap, but Cryptic is just so strong. And I naturally draw Cryptic, which is great. And yeah, this game's over. They, there's, I don't think there's a single card they can draw here that can get them out of this. Because I can always just recur Cryptic and kill them the following turn. So Destiny Spinner is good, but I'm going to force it. Again, get to fairy protecting my forces. There's nothing they can do. So at this point, the server crashed. And actually, this game, you may notice like my time's really low. I actually had to reconnect several times. The server was in the process of crashing. But I was able to appeal for a uh, refund. And instead of giving me a refund, I woke up this morning. These were all games I played last night. I woke up this morning and... Yay. Like, uh, I, the league had restarted, but like for whatever reason, they didn't keep this... Uh, they negated both the UK car deck... And the duel. Oh, and this is another. This is another one that uh, I won. Um, this is the Stoneblade Mirror, if I recall correctly. Very fun. So we're gonna see here that I have. Uh, I don't know what this person is on because they play different decks every time, if I recall correctly. I think I've played against them before. They're pretty good. Um, but I see them open Swamp. Okay, like who knows what that is? And Stone. Forge, in my opinion, if you can force the stone forge, it's better doing that than like waiting for uh, removing. It, you just preserve tempo, and uh, you know they might get a cryptic coat and run away with the game with that. So I, I do want to stop them from being able to search. So at this point, I am able to resolve my own stone forge mystic. So already favored in the matchup, even on the uh, draw, having resolved my stone forge where they have not resolved theirs, and I get Caldra. Again, like the the conventional wisdom is you just have to make them have it. Make them have removal. So reanimate. I was not expecting that. Unfortunately, there's nothing I can do about this. Uh, so they get Stoneforge back in play. So they're playing like a Stoneblade scam deck, which I'd never seen before. And it's probably suboptimal, which is one of the reasons I just completely uh, route them. But they ponder here. Uh, I'm just going to stop to see whether they shuffled at this point. They don't shuffle. Okay, so now they plow. I let them have it because I gave them life back. Uh, it's a two for one. And here comes the Cryptic Goat, I believe. Oh, the Cauldra. They're going to play Cauldra first. Okay, so luckily I have Prismatic Ending for Cauldra, and I'm pretty sure that's what I'm going to do here. You just don't want to take a bunch of damage. And Prismatic Ending is a nice clean answer, whereas Plow would have given him a bunch of life. And uh, I think I just had to hold because I don't have enough blue mana here because I've been fetching basics not knowing what they're on. I don't have enough mana to cast Murktide. But now I can cantrip. Uh, I think I have to wait another turn unless I find a land. I do find a land, but I opt instead of casting Murktide now, I think I opt to go ahead and... Uh, oh, no, I do cast Murktide, I think. Yeah. I, I, an alternate line would definitely have been to go ahead and take my time and thought seize them just to make sure they don't have removal and then also potentially cast a ponder and fill my graveyard even more so it could have been an 8-8 eight, eight instead of a 7-7 seven, seven. but the the calculus there is like yeah okay it's an 8-8 eight, eight instead of a 7-7 seven, seven, but you've forgone a turn beating down and meanwhile they're scrambling to try to find removal they've already used one of their plows right they've already used three cantrips they're, they're gonna, it's going to be hard for them to find it unless they just happen to have draws that line up so they're going to go ahead and put in coat. Coat doesn't matter here in terms of meaningfully impacting the race. Uh, grief does matter quite a bit. It takes away my 
brainstorm while also giving them a faster clock. But Merktide, this is why I play Merktide in Stoneblade. It seems counterintuitive. You're you're a value deck. Why are you playing a card that's just a big dumb flyer that just swings in, right? But Merktide steals so many games. Like I think I probably would have lost this game if I had not had a Merktide in my deck. But they resign uh, knowing that I've got lethal damage. And uh, yeah, they, again, if this had been like me cryptic coding or something like that, there's a chance they could have raced. But just hitting them every turn for seven in the air, strong. All right, game two. All right, so just a, I'm going to recap because I accidentally clicked through my mulligan there. Uh, mulliganing, even with decks that have Brainstorm and Ponder, it's not as important as like Tomb decks, things like that, but you generally want to uh, make sure that you don't have a non-functional opening hand. This hand, again, I'm not sure if they're playing Wasteland, but if they're playing Wasteland, this is potentially a bad hand. Uh, it's got lots of juicy, exciting cards. Murktide's late game cryptic. I can go fetch that with Stoneforge. So like, whenever I get an equipment in my opening hand, I almost kind of treat it as like a free mulligan because it wasn't going to be impactful anyway. So I do mulligan here. Get a much better hand. That uh, Caldera, of course, free card. I was going to put that back anyway. It's actually beneficial that I put it back in some respects because you don't want to draw all three equipment and not be getting card advantage off your Stoneforge. So I keep this. I've got removal. I've got cantrips. Uh, I'm going to have to fetch a non-basic to use those cantrips. I should probably fetch a non-basic anyway so I can get closer to casting Murktide. And I'm just going to pass. And grief. Not something I want to see, but it's much better that they're pitch casting. Grief is particularly oppressive when they're hard casting it later in the game because it's a two for one. And um, I mean, we saw how powerful grief hard cast out of uh, Reese game was. Okay. So here, Stoneforge, nothing I can do. Um, not even sure why I fetched here. I think I brainstormed to see if I can find a force. Yeah. And Actually, I do find a force. So Narset is the obvious pitch. I'm quite a ways away from casting Narset. But uh, instead, I choose to hold Narset for some reason and pitch the Murktide. I, I guess I'm pretty far away from casting Murktide as well. But I, I think... Uh, oh, actually, I put the Murktide back. And uh, yeah. All right. So now I... Um, Shuffle that, I believe. Choose not to shuffle. Okay, so I... Um, here we go. Second land. They're brainstorming. Got to get the brainstorms while you can before the the uh, Bowmasters comes out. And I presume that they're playing Bowmasters as well. So they went and got Crypticote, which is interesting because if they'd gotten Caldera, that would have been much stronger here. But either way, you know, the fact that I have a plow on top, uh, and I do believe, like, I brainstormed that back or, or I found that uh, with a ponder, so I knew that was on top. So here, I think the optimal cards to put back are, if I'm not going to be casting Bowmasters, Bowmasters just doesn't really impact the game here. Like, yes, there could be a situation where I can get a blowout, but they've already got a 1-2 blocker. Uh, they've got the Crypticode on the way. I think the way that my path to victory is probably through a protected... Murktide. And again, this is different from like a traditional control deck. Like this is like a Delver strategy, getting a Murktide in play and playing protect the queen. But it, it's nice to be able to pivot to that. So I do go ahead and make my giant Murktide. Comes in as a full size 8-8 eight, eight boy. I've got plow mana up and forced. Yep. And at this point they're Basically, um, they're going to put their code in at a weird time, but they have to remove this. So I draw Bowmasters, which I didn't know I was going to draw. It's beneficial, though. It provides additional reach. They play their own Bowmasters, which, again, I I'm still not dead on board. Like I think I'm going to win, so they're going to hit me for one, two, three, four, five, uh, potentially more if they bounce this, but I'm... I'm still winning the race. So it's not that big of a deal that I can, uh, that I can bow master their bow master. I just choose to take it here because if they fetch or do anything that costs them mana, like I have the win in hand, 
So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, th so this is a punt. So I should have just bow mastered them here and then I would have been able to attack with everything. They have one card in hand. They're tapped out. This could be a plow. I mean, that would be very bad. So maybe it wasn't right. Maybe the conservative play of just going ahead and removing their bowmasters wasn't that bad and giving them an extra turn. But uh, I do remove this. And here I just have to take the multi-turn line of attacking them and keeping my blockers back. There are two. They don't draw a plow or a canter. Even if they found a canter, it would probably kill them. So, yeah. I kind of got lucky there. Like, I do think that it would have been better to just probably attack them to death and assume that if they had plow in their hand, they would have cast it a long time ago. Okay. Moving on to, I think, the goblins matchup. So goblins, not a deck that I would traditionally consider Stoneforge to be favored in. I'm playing like 16 one drops uh, in my deck with the thought seizes, the ponders, the, the uh, swords of plowshares, and also... Um, yeah, brainstorm. So 16 one drops that get negated by chalice. And of course, you're going to see a lot of chalices this match. So I do throw back that hand and I I think I looked them up and suspected that they were on goblins. So I'm almost always going to want a thought seize turn one. And I go ahead and fetch the non-basic knowing that they could be a Blood Moon deck or a major deck. This hand is not what you want to see. It's just oppressive. There's Battle Cry, there's uh, Broadside Bombardiers, and there's Goblin Rabble Master. Now, I can't keep them off Battle Cry. They're going to be able to pitch Simeon Spirit Guide to get it in play. But the real threat here is Goblin Rabble Master. That card is just incredibly difficult to beat. Broadside Bombardiers is tough to beat too, but I just want to keep them off these three drops, so I do take the Shatter Skull Smashing. I don't really care about Agatha's Soul Cauldron. I, I'm, I almost feel like that's like a dead card in the matchup, but it might have some combo potential I'm not aware of. Uh, and frankly, this may be a suboptimal build uh, that they're playing because I've, I haven't seen Agatha's Soul Cauldron in Goblin decks. I usually just see it in Cradle Control decks. Okay, so here they did pitch cast and they bring out the Cavern, of course, the, the Nightmare card in the matchup, but they don't have the mana to bring out their threat. So I'm like, cool. And I wait for it to hit me because I don't want to recast it. I actually think about casting it and I'm like, no, what am I doing? I'm going to cast it in the end step. So that way they had to blow a whole turn's tempo recasting it. They play Soul Cauldron, which again, doesn't do anything here. The only card that I use my graveyard in my entire deck is Murktide. So, um, and Murktide doesn't really care about you exiling one random card. It's going to find enough cards in there to eventually come out. All right, so I've got uh, Borrower on the adventure. Uh, I don't have anything going on. I'm basically just hoping that they don't draw. Uh, but let's see if I can find a stone forge. I do find a Murktide, which is awkward because Murktide doesn't really do anything in this context because I'm so far away and they're going to be hitting at least one card out of my graveyard every turn. So I, I think I shuffle this. I didn't shuffle. Okay, so I think I am going to go ahead and get rid of this Agatha Soul Cauldron. I just spent like three minutes like knocking it as a card, but yeah, uh, here it's preventing me from Merc Tiding, so I am going to get it. And he's going to take one more card on the way out. So Battle Cry's back. No big surprise there. Uh, it's it's delightful, actually, that it's coming back in and that it's not uh, Rebel Master. So here I've got lots of lands. I'm going to go ahead and brainstorm just to make the Merc Tide even bigger. I think I put back two lands, and then I can fetch. And then I can ponder as well and get an even bigger one. So uh, I shuffle. It was like, I think it was like three lands there. And then I'm able to resolve Murktide and it's pretty big. It's like, I think it's the seven, seven. Yep. And you can see the Bowmasters. That's going to be good. So they can't profitably attack. I'm able to swing. Uh, I think I just, yeah, I think it's correct to go ahead and remove this battle cry here. Oh, I actually played out Borrower. Um, yeah, because this was the end step. So, yeah, they concede perhaps prematurely, but they know that I've got Lethal on board. If they were to... Oh, wait, no, I have Lethal right now. So, yeah, it wasn't a premature concession. Okay. 
Now, let's go into this one. Game two. Of course, I've boarded in my Hydroblast. I may have even boarded in... I board in Containment Priest here. I think that's good to stop like the uh, unlikely but possible Muxus attack. The Muxus ETB. He pitches Muxus here, and he's going to do something really nasty that I was talking about earlier, which is cast Chalice of the Void. I do have Prismatic Ending, but I have to get lucky and draw land because I don't have a way to like find it, and I do get lucky. So... Better lucky than good getting the second land. Okay, so he plays out a second Chrome Mox just as something to shock me with. He swings. Opts not to throw the Mox. And now I can remove the Chalice. And I even have a Force of Will for a backup Chalice. Keeping Chalice off the table is important because Plow is my answer here. And, and sure enough, I am able to remove that. He thinks about uh, potentially throwing that but decides not to. Okay, so here, priority number one, just get the threat out of the way. He's got two cards in hand. There is a chance that, like, I get some whiffs, but it looks like he's casting something. It is just a battle cry. Okay, so battle cry again. And you'll note that Tomb is doing some damage to him. He's at 16 now. So with Stoneforge Mystic in hand, I think it makes sense to go ahead and get Cauldra. But instead, what I like to do in these situations is to go get um, Batter Skull, just because this is an aggro matchup, and I think it's good here. I think it's a good decision. Even though they're low on life. All right, and I am going to uh, wait until combat, and they pump twice. They really want to get rid of this Batter Skull. I think that this is a dubious decision. Um, I think maybe just chilling would have been fine, but I think maybe they didn't have a choice because what if I do resolve this? If they don't have any action in their hand, they're just going to take four every turn. Like, but battle cry seems really strong when you have, if you wait around, like and invest in the future, battle cry is really strong in terms of increasing board presence, creating those tokens here. I get Caldera. I can't immediately use Caldera because I don't have white mana. So I just attack this, they start exiling cards from my graveyard. I play Bowmasters, and the clock is just incredibly oppressive here. And I think I have a lethal attack. Yeah, doing eight damage. Yeah, that's it. So, Goblins. Hard matchup, especially with, when they Chalice. This Goblins player didn't have the most explosive hands. But this is probably, aside from Rescam, this is like the second most challenging and heart pounding of the. Uh, of the matches. So I know that this player, this player has been on Bosch and rolls channel, uh, like with a donated deck, they've been playing this deck pretty much exclusively got a lot of trophies with it. So I need to respect it. Uh, I know that they're on reanimator and it's not like your grandpa's reanimator. It's like basic lands reanimator, uh, very powerful, very hard to disrupt, especially game one. And, uh, I've heard that like, reanimate or i'm sorry uh the dredges um dredges game one percentage is like something like 70 percent uh 80 percent of game ones will be won by the dredge deck because it's just so hard to stop it's so explosive so i'm gonna ponder and i'm gonna see what i can find here so uh i keep a plow which is not the greatest card in fact i think i may even board out plows um okay so we are going to see that indeed it is faithless looting. The conventional wisdom, the heuristic I use is just force whatever they put on the stack. Anything you can stop, stop it. I'm slowing them down a little bit. I don't really have a clock or anything like that, but it doesn't matter. I I still think it's correct to force there. Uh, the card that I pitch here, Narset, she's not going to do anything because unfortunately, like they can almost always dredge to avoid drawing. So here, don't have a lot of plays. I just play a land. I do have Bowmaster, so I can Bowmaster myself, and I make a misplay here right away. So they're Coliseuming. I see they only have one Dredger. Uh, I'm like, okay, cool. Well, they're going to draw at least two cards, right? But I don't think about the fact that they're going to dredge and find other Dredgers. They've got 11 Dredgers, I think, in their deck. So, you know, from a probability standpoint, they're almost certainly going to find another Dredger. And in fact, they do. And my Bowmaster doesn't grow at all. What happens instead is they reveal a whole lot of Cabal Therapies. 
They reveal two bridge from belows. Uh, so what I should have done here, 100%, I should have waited until I had priority and then Bowmastered Bowmaster itself. Then I could have removed two of the bridges. But instead, they're going to be able to flashback Cabal Therapy. And they get Poxwalkers. They get so much stuff going on. And uh, I am quickly overrun, and I just concede. Because there's no path to victory here. Like, I've got a single plow in my hand, and they, they can create, I don't know, like uh, two. So they have two bridges. So each uh, therapy, I mean, they could even, they could potentially create an army of like 20 zombies here. It's like nightmare. All right. Game two. So I have brought in the hate. Uh, and, uh, sorry, that's an old habit. So let's take a look at my mulligans. So I mulligan very aggressively here. This amazing hand that you would keep in normal circumstances, gotta go. No hate. Another hand that would be not bad, you just put the batter skull back. You have a three lander, three spell deck, put it back. Not good enough. Unfortunately, you're gonna hit these types of hands too that just don't have land. I have 20 land in my deck. Uh, approximately, you know, like 7% or 7% of hands, 6% of hands aren't going to have like a blue source, but like really you shouldn't get like no landers at all. It's like one or 2%, but unfortunately I did get a no lander here. So I have to put that back too. So I'm putting back three cards here. Um, but this is a banger. I got Lavinia back this time. Now spell bomb MVP. So I think I put back both of my forces and probably my ponder. Um, yeah, let's see what I put back. I may have kept the ponder. No, I kept a force of negation. And the reasoning is nightmare scenario. I can potentially take out um, like a, um, the flashback, uh, faithless looting. Yeah, I can potentially exile the faithless looting or the, uh, gaze otherworldly gaze i think is the one that they can also flashback and of course like most of their non-creature cards in their deck have flashback so being able to negate it is like stopping two spells it's like a two for two almost so here play out the spell bomb the strongest turn one play you can do against your edge in my opinion they have zero turn one plays which is heartening uh, i now have a force negation that i can pitch to um to, or I'm sorry, I have a Hydroblast that I can pitch to Force, force of Negation, and I can keep my Lavinia. Lavinia being a very strong card in this matchup as well. So they have so many free spells. Get my land, and now Lavinia is coming in. Lavinia being two two, it's a clock. All right, they have now they have uh, Poxwalkers, very strong new card, and they also have uh, a Dredger. So. I'm going to have to navigate this carefully. Okay, they've got a bridge in the graveyard now. I have a backup Lavinia, which I did consider actually casting Lavinia because Lavinia until Lavinia, one of them dies and I can remove the bridge, but I don't think it's worth it for one of them, especially when I have the Nile Spell Bomb out already. All right, and now they have a second bridge. So at this point, this now spell bomb is really burning a hole in my pocket. All right? So I decide here, like, I'm just going to spell bomb. Like, if they get this narco in play, they have priority. They can potentially flashback. Uh, actually, they don't have, but they have all four bridges in their graveyard. And I just, I don't want to take any chances with it, that they have, like, something in hand. And I just exile their graveyard, and I believe they scoop with all four bridges gone. And I'm even able to cantrip off this. Yeah, they scoop. All right, game three. So at this point, my heart's pretty much racing. Like, this is as fired up as I get in a matchup because Dredge is just so punishing. You make a mistake. This has one point of turn zero interaction on the draw. My thinking is generally I will surgical cards like um, Narcomiva, potentially Poxwalkers. Like you stop those and then you 
prevent them from going crazy with the uh, bridge from bullows. So I do keep this. It's a good card, good hand. Orcish Bowmasters can ping itself. Stoneforge Mystic, if they peter out, can go get Caldera and close the game. I'm 100% the control deck here. So I do let them otherworldly gaze. No interaction for me. They put a tr- Grave Troll. Like a few months ago, I might have thought, like, oh, I should surgical that Grave Troll because that is how they're going to get even more cards in their graveyard. But now I realize, at least for this version of Dredge, you really do want to go after the Narcomevis. So I hold it. I just play land, and uh, I think I do go ahead and cast Ponder just to see if I can find a Force Effect. Containment Priest, total house in this matchup. So I'm very disciplined. I uh, I draw the Containment Priest. I don't expose it to Cabal Therapy. So obviously, having two Bowmasters in hand, if I mean, that's definitely like a, uh, a two for two. If they have a creature that they can flash back, they can take all my... Bowmasters, the card that they'll name when they flashback is probably, or when they initially Cobalt Therapy is probably Surgical Extraction. Careful study. I just have to let it happen. So they now have a bridge from below in their graveyard. They have a Pox Walkers, um, and they have Faithless Looting, which they can flashback, and they have Anger, which gives all their creatures haste if it's in the graveyard. Oldie but goodie. So here... Containment Priest, and I am patient. I like, you don't have to main phase Containment Priest. They're generally not going to have a way to interact with it, and you can snipe stuff uh, into exile and completely ruin their plan here. So at this point, they have two bridges. I need to be very careful. I think that this is where they do flashback something, and I'm able... So, of course, it's tempting to just Bowmasters here and get a bunch of credit, but you, you got to respect the fact that... Uh, that they can win really quickly, even if you have a pumped up orc army. So I do go ahead and bring in containment priest. And this is not a may ability. So this is going to get exiled. Containment priest comes in and really like we can fast forward here. These get exiled. Uh, Containment priest is just such a house in this matchup. I'd say uh, it's the single most devastating card you can play against dredge. And I was able to find it in my top 15 cards or so, however many I looked at here. So, you know, the bridges are dead. They were hoping to hard cast this Narco Amoeba, flashback um, a Cabal Therapy and get four zombies. That would have been strong. I mean, that potentially would have raced me. They don't know that I have the Merc Tide. They probably could have raced it. But, uh, and they also don't know that I have the Surgical in hand. But yeah, uh, now they're not going to get any they do, I think, go ahead and they attack, and I think they flash back. So they're putting more stuff in there. Yep, here's the flashback. Again, not getting any zombies because I removed uh, their bridges. They they name plow, and uh, yeah, I, I do think they flash back again to take the uh, surgical, which is interesting because like I've got batter skull. Batter skull should be an extremely strong card against them. But no, they are more scared of surgical at this point because it's more of an impediment to their game plan. Here, doing some, probably doing another uh, flashback. If they haven't, what are they doing? Oh, Ox. And of course, I've got the Hydroblast. They know I've got the Hydroblast, but they can recur at every turn. They've got so many cards in their graveyard. So I do have to respect the Ox. Um, and I, Ox isn't that scary when you have a Bowmasters that you can play. I go ahead and play my Murktide here. I mean, this game is kind of over, but it's just a question of like how it's going to end. So they are able to play this out. It's just a, a blocker. This is a death touch creature. It doesn't say death touch on it. And I've lost a Merc Tide before when I was like, oh, it's just a, bl- a chump blocker. But then I realized, oh, it's got death touch. They don't actually call it death touch. Some old templating or something, right? So anyway, here we go. Uh, I've got such a strong board presence. The second Merc Tide doesn't do anything. Uh, he opts to go ahead and block my solo attacker, taking uh, Batter Skull out. I do have the ability to equip Batter Skull, and the game's over. Like, this is total victory in my book. Like, uh, this person never had a chance because I'm playing white. If I were playing Sultai, which, you know, Sultai's hard. You really have to get Pernicious Deed or something like that to deal with their shenanigans, but white, you have access to 
Lavinia and Containment Priest, two amazing cards. You've got exile based removal in case you need it. Like white is so strong. It's just not as perceived to be as strong uh, right now, but I still love it. Okay. Two more games. So, or two more matches. This is, uh, this I believe is rescam. So rescam, my least favorite deck in the format other than Mississippi river. I lose a lot to Mississippi river too, unfortunately. All right. So this is a strong keep. Um, I don't, I think I know, I don't, I don't think that I know that they're on scam, but them forcing my thoughts is, is definitely kind of like a wake up call. Like, Oh, spider sense is tingling. This is not going to be good. And, uh, they don't waste me for some reason. And I'm like, that's weird, but it's not weird once I see that they are cycling for troll. So the reason that they forced my thoughts is, was because I would have taken troll and they wouldn't have had any colored mana. So good play from them. Uh, and if I'd realized that that was the situation, I guess I could have forced back because I think I did have the force in my hand at that time, but going to help and speculatively over, it just didn't seem like a, a good call in retrospect. Maybe that would have been better. Um, we'll, I hadn't thought about that. So here they entomb. They've got a tracks on their graveyard. Terrifying. And I basically just have to hope. Uh, so I force there trying to stop them from putting it back. I usually don't force the entomb if they already have a troll in their graveyard, but, uh, usually forcing entomb is correct. Uh, I think I may not have had extra mana available and, they usually have days, unfortunately. Uh, yep. Yeah. So, Entomb again, not a big deal. Or it doesn't seem to be a big deal because they've already got their crazy unkillable or like difficult to kill, you know, crazy ETB trigger creature in play. But um, here, I'm just going to go ahead and cast a Murktide. This Teferi could potentially be really good. All right, swinging, doing some damage. Again, not going to matter if they reanimate Atraxa. So here, this is a trick you can do. When Animate Dead comes into play, it has to stay in play and then it retargets the second time. It's weird. But you can actually respond by bouncing it or removing it. And that's what I do. So if I had Teferi in play, I could have, you know, instant speed prismatic ending it and you, they never get the ETB. So at this point, I'm feeling pretty strong. I've got this in background. Uh, I now have a Caracas, which I can use if they bring back Atraxa. They don't know that. So they do bring back Atraxa. And um, yeah, I bring this in. They do have a daze. Again, second daze. So I'm fighting through a lot of hate. Uh, but this is, this is the power of daze. Like people are like, I see people daze random cards. Like, oh, I guess I'll use this days, but like days can convert like turn. What turn is this turn eight? It converted. It was very meaningful and impactful because you know, they would have had to deal with yet another creature and uh, it's not going to matter here because I do have the bounce effect and I am going to their removal light deck. Okay. Let's see what they grab. So they grab a grief here. Um, they choose ponder force animate dead grief. Basically, for insane, extremely powerful cards. You think about Animate Dead, that gets back uh, Archon. Yeah. So I think I'm dead here because uh, I think they just reanimate. And again, if I had, um, imagine a world where I had not been dazed. I would have had a creature that I can sack to this Archon and then I can attack in and potentially trade after having bounced Atraxa. Let's see, did they, they didn't get, what did they get here? I, I forgot what they, they got. So they have a force in hand and they have a grief and they have ponder. So they do have a force card, but they can't stop my Caracas, right? So, so I was going to get both their uh, Atraxa and their Archon out of play. But as it is, you know, I have to sack my Murktide and the game is pretty much over. Like I can kind of stave off uh, Archon with Bowmaster, but it's not really going to matter. And I do bounce here 
but now it's yet another card that they can pitch to force. So I'm very far from being able to, uh, yeah, and there's the force, and that's it. So I think that that was a pretty close game. I do think that that days saved them. Um, they might have won even with the days. Uh, they were getting into hard cast grief territory, so their deck gets a lot better once they have four lands out. Game two. So uh, I played against a guy who had played like 10. He won this big tournament here in Dallas, uh, the Hunter Burton Open Memorial. And he had not lost a single game. He went through like seven or eight rounds of Swiss, and then he also um, showed up at this local and defeated me, defeated some other people. He finally lost his first game uh, Thursday night. But shout out to Boardwalk Games here in Dallas where we play. But, yeah, I mean, Rescam is incredibly powerful. And he told me he always takes out, pretty much, he takes out the really crazy cards, um, the Atraxa and the Archon. And I was like, I have to still assume that he's not doing it. So the way I board is generally, if we open this up here, I'll just go, oops, it's not letting me. Uh, the way I board in Rescam currently is what I'll do is I'll take... Uh, I put all these cards in and uh, Contain a Priest, like these are the four cards I bring in. And the cards I take out are, usually I'll take some number of Thoughtseize, like two Thoughtseize, and then I'll take my Planeswalkers out just because they're going to get dazed or they're going to get killed by Bowmasters. Planeswalkers are not strong against Bowmasters decks. So, yeah. But um, Thoughtseize, isn't that great if they're on the beatdown strategy with Douthies? So... I, uh, but I still, uh, like, frankly, you have to, that's the problem with this deck. This is, that's why this deck is problematic. It attacks on so many different angles. And, you know, Grief, I would love for Grief to get banned. Frankly, I used to play Grief, and um, I've scammed people many times. So it might sound like a hypocrite, but genuinely, like, I, I do think that this deck is too powerful. But that said, let's go beat it. So we're going into game two. And as I said, I boarded out my Planeswalkers. Uh, how do I get back to the replay? Okay, here it is. All right. So I do have powerful cards in my deck. I guess I didn't take... I, I may have taken out all four Thoughtseize because I'm on the play. Uh, and or on, No, actually, that doesn't make sense. Okay. So I mulligan, and I find the Nile Spell Bomb. Okay. That is a keep, because turn one, I can have something in play that stops the absolute nightmare scenario. All right, now spell while I'm in. I am happy to see this, as opposed to like a Entomb. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and dig before they can Bowmaster me. And it looks like I did keep uh, all three of my planeswalkers. Again, I did trim the second Narset uh, recently, uh, right after this, because I felt like two Narsets were too many. And replaced it with a, a third Merc Tide. Okay. So they're spinning their wheels. We don't know what they're doing over there. At this point, I could hard I, I could cast Teferi, but like there's no reason to subject my Teferi to a daze. Here, Containment Priest, just like the best possible top deck. And we're going to see Powder Keg, which is strong. And I'm not going to wait because they don't play a lot of removal. I think it, well, I guess I did wait in this case, but I do genuinely think that it's good to go ahead and put Containment Priest in. I think what I'm thinking is that I can get a card out of their hand just in case they do have removal. So Shield or Zeta can be an issue here. Um... I probably mistapped because now I can't, um, I can't Caracas or um, I should have tapped this underground seat. This does nothing really that a Tundra wouldn't do. So they tick it up. At this point, they can kill my Nile spell bomb, but they opt not to. Instead, to ponder, um, maybe they're still trying to set up their recursion line because at this point, I'm pretty sure that they are still playing. Okay, in this. Normally, Bowmaster's incredible card against Teferi, but I'm going to make the classic legacy 
play pattern of bow mastering their bow master here. Got lots of lands this time. I'm feeling a lot better. And with Teferi, I don't have to worry about days. And I think it's premature. Like they don't know, but what I was going to do is I was definitely going to bounce their powder keg um, just to slow them down and keep them. And I had containment priest. I, I was in a strong position, but I do think that they probably prematurely conceded there. They still got six cards in hand. All right. Again, I don't know. Maybe it's just a bunch of land. Maybe it's a bunch of reanimation spells. Uh, it is kind of an AB te deck. Even though you can pitch everything to grief, uh, you can end up with redundant, you know, A cards and B cards in your hand with, you know, not matching them up together. So, four lander, but it's got Containment Priest. I have to respect the reanimation plan, so I keep this. And also, note, like, three basics. I play four basics in my deck, and they only play three Wastelands in their deck, but every single Wasteland seems so devastating against this deck. Like, it... It is really surprising how powerful the Wastelands are because there are only three of them and it's not even really like a big part of their game plan. They're not trying to temple you out. They're just trying to like mildly disrupt you. They have a couple extra land because they're playing a two-color deck, they can play Wasteland. All right. So Entomb, don't stop it because I've got Containment Priest. I've got Days Protection on Containment Priest and I am just going to main phase this here. Uh, and I they scoop. They scooped a containment priest. I think that they don't have any uh, removal on their deck and that uh, they were really hoping to get the Atraxa into play. So uh, what would have happened? I would have probably just stoneforged and gone and gotten Cauldra and started beating them down. But I think they were probably tilted by the fact that I had so many basics and they, they weren't going to be able to squeeze me on that axis. I don't know. But uh, one thing is you don't attack with containment priests just because they may have a bowmaster. And if they're able to Bowmaster and block, that kills your Containment Priest and unlocks their card. So final match, Spatula of the Ages. Not really a game for the Ages from his side of the table, but I start off like complimenting him. You can see here, like, I love your username. Have you seen UHF? There's this UHF uh, is this movie from the 90s. Very good, weirdo Yankovic movie. And there's this skit in there called Spatula City. It's just absurd and ridiculous, and I love it. So... Um, I'm complimenting him and then, uh, he, he says kind of words, but it, he starts to get salty. You'll see. So I've got a strong hand. Uh, I know he's on Enchantress. He's a dedicated Enchantress player. And what card does Enchantress not want to see? They don't want to see Orcish Bowmasters. They don't want to see Narset. So here I just throw this out there. I'm confident they'll be able to interact with it, but I just want to, you know, Keep the pressure on. I force the namesake of the deck. I think that's correct, even if I have a Narset in my hand, just to keep that out of play. And here, uh, I think I just go ahead and resolve the Narset. No, I uh, I wait. Okay, that might be a misplay, because obviously they're just going to remove this real quick. I do get an attack in, and that does matter, but I think just resolving Narset... They could have, so Leyline Binding is a card that they're playing now, and that does remove Narset. We'll see you in a minute. So at this point, I've got my Stone Forge that doesn't do anything, but I am able to go Stone Forge and get a different card, and so I can EOT Cryptic Coat if I need to with my uh, non summoning sick Stone Forge Mystic. Another, um, and unfortunately, they're going to double cantrip off this because this card uh, draws a card, and now basically every land i'd never seen this card before but it basically it's kind of like a mini guild pack ley line card in that all your lands have all the land types and i didn't think about that but the fact that that's in the deck probably means that choke's not in the deck because you wouldn't want to choke yourself um okay so i put in cryptic coat again a card that's been overperforming for me i love it I'm so happy they printed it it's probably the reason why i'm playing stoneblade again all right, I'm able to thought seize. They bail, which sucks. If I had cast Narset first, then I would have been able to uh, potentially stop them. But one thing to note is they're going to draw a card here, but they've tapped out of interaction, and now I can resolve Narset. First, I go ahead and attack and just turn everything sideways, just trying to reduce their life total. Uh, Enchantress can technically block, but you're never going to see that unless they're desperate, which... Spoiler alert, they may get desperate later. Okay, so here, uh, 
Swords is basically a dead card against their deck. They have like one or two creatures that are worth plowing. And so I just take the ponder for four potential looks at a, um, I'm not sure what a disruptive spell would be like. Probably like a Teferi would be very good here. So they don't get to draw off the Leyland Binding, but they do get to remove. So here we go. Destiny Spinner. And they do get to draw two cards here. And they now have a threat in play. Keep in mind, though, there are seven life because I've been attacking with the little weenies. So here, I draw a Brazen Borrower, and I'm just so happy to draw this. Uh, I think the play is to go ahead and bounce Leyland Binding and just force them to recast it. They're tapped out. So now I can go ahead and get something in. Wow, what a turn of events. I've actually got black mana, and I can Thought Seize them again. So I do that. I Thought Seize them. Take away the Leyland Binding. Uh, they do have uh, Green Suns, which can get all kinds of nasty stuff. They have a lot of mana. I think Leyland is still the take here, though, just because like uh, Doomwake Giant, I think, is a card that is like a big creature, but it's not green. They can't get it with Green Sun. So I don't know what they would get with Green Sun. Anyway, I just take the Leyland Binding, keep my Narset in play, and uh, I think I go ahead and attack. I keep these back to protect Narset from Destiny Spinner Lands, which doesn't really matter because they have the ability to give Trample, but if they only have four enchantments in play, then Trample isn't necessarily going to get through. And I'd happily sacrifice these two if it meant keeping Narset around for an extra turn. So I ponder. I find Teferi, which is amazing, given my mana right here. And next turn, Teferi is going to come down. And at this point, they're like, oh, come on. They're really upset that I, I've been able to uh, chain together Narsets like that. And... Paying a lot of mana for a big green sun. They get this card. I'd never seen it before, but basically it returns a permanent. Uh, it's it's like a kind of a fancy uh, menace version of uh, Eternal Witness. Yeah. So here they don't attack or anything. They don't. I'm actually kind of surprised, but I guess they've tapped out. And how much does this cost to activate? Yeah, it costs four mana. So they would have used one. This doesn't generate mana. So they really only have this and this. And this. So they they only have one, two, three, four, five, six, six mana total. So they couldn't both get that and uh and what they did, by the way, is they did use that to get back their ley line binding because their plan is to get rid of Narset. But what they're probably not really thinking about is the fact that this cryptic coat is unblockable. Like I don't have to bounce it into my hand. I can just keep attacking every turn. And then uh of course I find a brainstorm. I could have definitely gotten a, a force of will. That would have worked too because I could have just Teferi, Force of Will, um, thrown that into the uh, thrown that into the Leyland that they're casting and still won that way. I just need to attack. And at this point, um, I think, yeah, Bowmasters has the alternate text on it, which is win the game when your opponent is at one life. And that's what happens. And at this point, they're, they're pretty pissed off. Like our friendly conversation about spatulas has since turned into like, I'm playing for a trophy here. Damn it. Screw you and your lucky top decks. Like that kind of talk. Um, and you, you, I'll just show you. He's like, your draws are something else. And, uh, you know, I keep like a really strong hand. So my argument is like, these are not just draws. This is like selective keeping, right? Um, which some people might say, oh, you just got a good, a strong opening hand. Like a lot of people might throw this back, right? I, I think it's a pretty strong hand though. It's got Brainstorm. Uh, I, I don't think you throw back Bowmaster's hands in this matchup. And Prismatic Ending is very much alive. I've sort, cited out all my plows and I brought in Lauren. And I have Lauren plus Caracas, which is potentially backbreaking. So I'm not going to deny that this is a good hand, but it's just, uh, it was kind of irritating that he he was uh, getting tilted. Um, okay, so here I'm just going to start off with some lands. Nothing exciting happens the first few turns. Um, uh, you know, I'm not on these. I don't use these. Um, I, I just like having my lane come in to play untapped with all the days is floating around. It's not really beneficial in this deck, but I could see it being beneficial in some decks. Okay. So Chantress, public enemy, number one, nothing I can do to remove that. It's got shroud. I do have two dress downs in my deck, just in the situation where I'm able to somehow like dress down and remove it's, um, but it doesn't really matter when you have, um, you're not going to remove it with Bowmasters when you have the rest of it in play. Okay, Sterling Grove. 
unfortunately nothing I can do about this. Uh, I think I just, okay. So why am I fetching basic swamp and things like this? It's because, oh, oh, so I'm fetching right here because he's about to get, uh, an enchantress trigger and I want to ping him. Um, but I'm fetching because I'm thinking, oh, if he has carpet of flowers, that's backbreaking. Like I'm not going to give him any carpet of flowers, mana, and I'm not going to let him choke me. So I have three non-island lands in my deck, four if you count the Caracas, and I can go quite a ways without ever using blue. And you can see my hand doesn't really depend on blue anyway. Like the most I'm going to do is brainstorm something away with blue. So I go ahead and play that out, and, and now I'm going to bring the beats. And this is where things get really good for me. So I Lauren. He has no choice but to sack the Sterling Grove, which this doesn't put it in your hand. It puts it on top of your deck, so it's still kind of a two-for-one. Uh, but he gets to get the best enchantment in his deck for the cer certain situation he's in right now. All right. Destiny Spender. Again, a strong card. Makes all of his uh, enchantments uncounterable and provides a wing con. This is just like a great card for Enchantress. It got printed a while back. Um so I have no choice but to let it resolve, but it is an enchantment creature, importantly. And on thin ice, of course, if I had played this out, they would have just targeted this, but because they're not targeting that, uh, so yeah, great. So this is, before it targets, I am gonna get a ping. And now my bone master's out of play, but uh, I don't even go after Destiny Spinner anymore. I just bounce, recast, get my Bowmaster back. And this is so backbreaking. Like, I can understand why they're tilted because this is the final. You've, you've won four matches and your opponent just happens to have Lauren of the Third Path plus Caracas. Two cards very few people at the top tables would be playing. Because again, this is like an underdog deck. This is like a you know, 2013 deck, right? Just slightly modernized with the Bowmasters. And the Merc Tides. So, yep, Leyline Binding. At this point, they're playing scared. They, I believe they take, yeah, they play, they take this, um, which is correct. I think you want to get that out of play because I can keep recurring it. But you'll see with their other removal that they, uh, they do take the army instead of taking the Bowmasters itself. So I'm not sure how they expect to win without being able to draw cards, which is like, their deck's sole reason for existing basically is drawing crazy amounts of cards. I'm able to remove that. And then uh, I just go ahead and uh, attack here. And I conceal the fact that I have a second Bowmasters. Just, but I mean, I could definitely see leaving up mana for Bowmasters here. This, it's fortuitous that um, I didn't cast Bowmasters earlier to apply pressure because now I can take that out. It's a 2 1. Not going to. Lament people playing X1s in their deck. Here, that is a scared play. Like, not knowing that I already have a Bowmasters in play, I think I think you just try to find a removal for the Calder token itself. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know what their hand looks like, but they gave me a two-for-one. Now I can cast this, ping that down. I can attack. I may cast Lavinia here. I don't think I do. Um, I go ahead and instead and look for something. And I've got Containment Priest. If they Green Sun, I've got Force. Like basically, extremely strong position. This card is basically like Thespian Stage for enchantments. Each upkeep, you can like exile it and bring it back. And it just, every turn, let's lay line binding your opponent, basically. It's really bad. Um, so I, I was like, okay. I've, I recognize that. I did play a little bit of Enchantress back in the day. This is a newer card. I saw it and I was like, oh, wow, that's a cool addition of Enchantress. That's why he's playing blue. All right, so at this point, I play Containment Priest for pressure after the Green Sun Zenith, uh, you know, Sorcerer Speed, so I knew that wasn't coming out, and I just swing in. And really, there's nothing that they can do. I don't actually have Hardcast Force because I've fetched so disciplined around uh, cards like Choke and cards like uh, Carpet of Flowers. I mean, in retrospect, I absolutely could have fetched a blue, and then so that was a little bit precarious. But they didn't have anything. So, yeah, I got my trophy. Again, I'll, I'll show a screenshot of it over here. Yeah. Like this, I'm going to sell these. These I can get like two. So this is like just this right here is like two plus leagues that I can play in. And then so it's like being able to play four leagues, 
basically. And all I'm trying to do is go infinite so my wife doesn't complain about me charging $10 to the credit card every time I, uh, you know, three, two, uh, or two, three or worse. All right. Uh, you can see my constructive rating is going up. <laughs> all right. So I'll just show the deck one more time real quick, just because I love it. Uh, I'm so happy because I was playing soul tie control and I love soul tie control, soul tie beans, but I love playing kind of like a slightly underpowered deck, like the underdog deck. I love playing from behind the whole time and, and like having to figure out how to solve the attracts that they've resolved or something like that. I love that kind of gameplay. And I love long games. Uh, I don't love, you know, just scamming people, which again, I did that for a while. Um, I, I just love having Swords of Plowshares. This is my safety blanket. I love having Prismatic Ending. So I'll be making a lot more videos about Esper, Esper Stoneblade, but I think the strength of this deck, frankly, is right here. Like, game one, you can stop combo decks. Traditionally, control struggles with combo decks. Control players will all be like, oh yeah, I always beat combo decks. But like, if you look at the actual numbers, control decks are unfavored against like capable uh, storm players or capable breakfast players, people that are not just like yeeting everything in their hand turn one, that they're actually playing patient, assuming that you kept a force of will, right? Um, and this also it's, it's proactive. It's a one for one. Whereas force of will is uh one for two. You're going down on resources to stop some spell. This potentially stops cards that are very problematic for control decks like Orm's chant, like Teferi, uh, without having to, you know, pitch a bunch of cards from hand. Merktide is the other strong card that just the fact that it can steal games where your opponent just like out of nowhere, you've got like an 8-8 eight, eight flyer, and they're like, I was not expecting this. I was expecting to have three or four turns to fight a Caldra, right? Um, it, it's just like such a great kind of juke, and it's right there in the main deck. And if you're playing a grindier matchup, you can just side these out. You're playing against the Stoneforge Mystic deck or, or any deck that plays Swords of Plowshares, you can just side out your Merktides, and you can bring in Hateful Permanence. And White has the best hate around. It's got these. And then Lauren, really great card as we saw in that enchantress matchup and lauren does combo with orcish bow masters these two get get it on like uh you're you're basically amassing and you're pinging you can ping down their x ones you can even potentially cast uh, an orcish bow masters and then activate lauren and get a second ping and kill x twos which is a great feeling this card very strong anti-combo card uh i've i mentioned earlier that i've had a lot of trouble with uh Mississippi River. I'm not playing Wastelands. There's like basically nothing I can do to stop their game plan other than hoping that I can force a whole lot. But between this and these thought seizes, I have finally won. I think my first uh, serious match. I, like occasionally I'll beat like a Mississippi River that just doesn't know what they're doing. But somebody that is a dedicated Mississippi River player that plays it all the time, I was able to beat them uh, thanks to a combination of thought seizes and finding you know basically game ending cards like Lavinia essentially ends the game. Uh, containment priest doesn't end the game because they're actually casting things. I don't even think I board containment priest in, but damping sphere does in the game. So really these three cards plus your Teferi, very strong in that matchup. So I've talked a whole lot. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about uh, this deck and I hope you have a fantastic day. Remember be excellent to each other and party on dudes.